welcome to the second, the third uh, Salon Talk of our 2021 season. Uh, unfortunately, it's had to be virtual and hopefully next year we'll be able to all greet you in Thomas Cole's new studio. However, uh, it's wonderful to have you here. I'm Lisa Fox Martin, the chair of the Board of Trustees on behalf of all of us. We welcome you uh, for another wonderful talk and I'd like to introduce Betsy Jacks, our marvelous executive director who will introduce our riveting speaker today. So thank you again for joining us and we will see you next month. Thank you, bye. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. The Sunday Salons are here. It's our monthly series of lectures from January through April. And it began in 2004. Uh, and the idea was, let's talk about the parts of history that inform our most pressing, urgent issues today. Um, so with that, we today will have Nancy Siegel talking about the women who have been so overlooked uh, alongside their male counterparts in 19th century landscape painting. So um, Nancy is one of my favorite people. She has worked with us for about 15 years on various projects over the years, helping us, advising us. She's on our national council. And I just love her title today, Down Steep Rocks, Through Swamps and Woods, We Came to This Celebrated Place. And imagine doing that in a giant skirt with many layers and hoops and whatnot. So I think that it speaks to the perseverance of these women. Um, note that after the lecture, we will have the chance to have Q&A questions and answers. So we'll use the Q&A button at the bottom of everyone's screen. Um, you can type in questions there during the lecture as you think of them or at the end, whatever suits you. Um, so, uh, Nancy Siegel is the Professor of Art History and Culinary History at Towson University and specializes in American landscape studies, print culture, and culinary history of the 18th and 19th centuries. She gives talks about food, so you can bring her on for demonstrations as well. In 2010, she co-curated our very successful exhibition that many of you may remember. It was called Remember the Ladies, Women of the Hudson River School. And we are now working with her on a project for 2023. It's not been announced, but her provisional, our provisional title is Women, Land, and Art. So stay tuned about that. Most recently, Nancy was a contributing scholar for the exhibition Beyond Midnight, Paul Revere which traveled to the New York Historical Society and several other museums. She has served as the author, editor, and curator for many exhibitions and publications, too numerous to list. They're all available, of course, on the web for you to check out. Nancy is also, um, as I mentioned, on our National Council. And this group is some of the finest scholars in American art, American history, who inform everything we do. We bring them on for all of our projects, exhibitions, et cetera. And she in particular has been serving on all of our grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities, which inform our interpretation in the history at the historic site. She has also been the recipient of numerous research grants and fellowships. Uh, the one I mentioned, will mention here, she was a scholar in residence at the Obama Institute for Transnational American Studies. So I'm so delighted to have her here today. Please welcome Nancy Siegel. I know you'll enjoy her lecture. Great, Betsy, thank you so much. And thank you, Lisa. It is a pleasure to be here today. And I appreciate the invitation to speak. I also wanted to uh, quickly thank Heather Powerback and Amanda Malstrom for working out the logistics of this for this seamless webinar. I appreciate that. Um, it's always wonderful to be at the Thomas Cole National Historic Site, which is such a special place for me. And I imagine that it is for so many of you as well, um, especially now that we can't be together in Catskill. Um, I hope that today you find yourself in a comfy chair with a nice cup of tea, as I do here, um, as we turn our thoughts to better days and getting out of doors once again and back into nature.
So I'm thrilled to speak with you. Um, not only will my talk today provide an historical backdrop to some of the ways in which landscape painters, women artists in particular, have come to appreciate and capture on canvas the beauty and awe found all around us, but I'm so grateful to Betsy and Kate McCanary for inviting me to guest curate the 2023 exhibition at the Thomas Cole House, which expands upon the Remember the Ladies, Women of the Hudson, School, Hudson River School exhibition. My intention for that exhibition, partnering with the wonderful Jennifer Krieger, was to widen the scope of knowledge on American women landscape painters of the 19th century and to introduce the public to as many women artists as their works would fit on the walls. For this new iteration, Kate, Amanda, and I will be creating an exhibition that includes both historical and contemporary women showcasing through a series of deep dives the myriad ways in which women engaged and continue to engage with the landscape. In addition to unpacking terminology that has guided landscape studies for the past decade, such as ecofeminism, cultural tourism, and even the word landscape itself, we strive to bring awareness to where we are in this narrative. While we may have answered Linda Nochlin's seminal question of why have there been no great women artists, we are repositioning this with why have there been no great retrospectives of great American women landscape artists. The 2023 exhibition aims to address that void. And as we continue to celebrate Women's History Month, I am repeatedly reminded, oh, we'll talk about this in just a minute, uh, of Abigail Adams' quote to her husband, I desire you would remember the ladies. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion. Adam's ideas concerning the position of women in the soon to be nation and their ability to express themselves freely became increasingly important in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. In particular, women would play an active role in the acquisition of knowledge about the newly established United States including a desire to explore the landscape. By the early decades of the 19th century, women traveled in increasing numbers to experience American scenery and wrote poetically of their adventures. Many of these women also aspired to paint professionally. They produced works of art positioned high and low on the hierarchy and were inspired by the landscape, just as Thomas Cole, Asher Durand, and Frederick Church. But this enlightened notion was not universally applauded in the 19th century, as demonstrated in the following article, Die Frauen in der Kunstgeschichte, Women in the History of Art, by Ernst Gull, a professor from Berlin who wrote, quote, Volumes have been written on the long disputed point, whether the mental powers of women be equal to those of men. Women, say the defenders of the present system of things, have opened no new vistas in the realms of thought with a few brilliant exceptions. They have produced nothing really great in art, and an exception does not form the rule. What they have not achieved in the course of 18th centuries, they are not likely to achieve in the 19th. We have no female Raphael or Michelangelo. This is when in person, sometimes I'll hear growling from the audience, so feel free to add your own growls here. Gull's essay appeared in the 1858 American edition of the Westminster Review and reflects the intellectual and aesthetic environment into which works by women artists were received. Gull summarized the state of the condition of women artists as he believed it to exist, he continued. The profession of the painter would seem in many respects particularly fitted for women. It demands no sacrifice of maiden modesty or of matronly reserve. It leads her into no scenes of noisy revelry or unseemly license. It does not force her to stand up to be stared at, commented on, clapped, or hissed by a crowded and often unmannered audience who forget the woman in the artist. Gull's assessment was a mid-century barometer for the perceived abilities of women in intellectual and artistic realms. However, by the middle decades of the 19th century, increasing numbers of American women aspired not only to paint professionally, but achieve personal and financial success as artists, in part as a result of the training they acquired abroad, and despite setbacks such as inflated tuition for women at the Academy Julian. Their ability to travel beyond the United States is part of a larger discussion related to developments in the area of tourism and education for women in the 19th century, and this talk serves to broaden the discussion. 
But who are these women? They are artists such as Louisa Davis Minot, Sarah Cole, sister to Thomas Cole, Harriet Caney Peel, wife of Rembrandt Peel, Susie Barstow, Mary Josephine Walters, Fanny Frances Palmer, Anne Sophia Tangdara, Laura Woodward, Eliza Greatorex, Mary Nemo Moran, the list goes on and on. Beyond their supporting roles as wife, sister, niece, and daughter, these are talented and accomplished landscape artists who until recently have received little scholarly attention. Working alongside male, counterpart, uh, male companions or alone in their studios, they captured on canvas the beauty and awe they experienced out of doors. They exhibited their work at the National Academy of Design, the Artist Fund Society, the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, and the Boston Athenaeum to name but a few of the prestigious venues in which their work was shown annually. While the moniker of amateur artist was equally available to both men and women, the designation of professional artist was far more restrictive for women. From reading personal accounts and diaries as early as the 1820s, we know that women traveled to and explored places of natural beauty. A growing tourist industry in America by the mid 1820s resulted in the increased production of travel guides that highlighted specific sites that women might enjoy viewing as well as offering detailed advice on appropriate clothing to bring on such excursions. Robert Fulton and Robert Livingston's 1807 sail from New York City to Albany aboard the North River Steamboat launched the inauguration of steamboat travel along the Hudson River. As more Americans began to consider the Hudson Valley as a tourist destination, steamboat companies flourished by mid-century, offering passengers efficiency, speed, and panoramic views of the Hudson. The Lady Clinton and Lady Van Rensselaer afforded tourists male and female a passing panoramic view of the Hudson, and by 1848, the new steamboat, the Rip Van Winkle, made the trip three times a week. Although the name of this steamer doesn't instill notions of time efficiency, state rooms and berths were always reserved for railroad passengers, acknowledging the multiple means of transport tourists often required. Women traveled to sites of interest in the company of friends, often kept safe from the peering eyes of men through their relegation to ladies' cabins on canal boats and steamboats. Affordable travel allowed not only greater access to view the landscape, but to be viewed as well. Willis Gaylord Clark commented in 1835, quote, did you never particularly relish a jaunt on board a steamboat when you found some beautiful woman there? Tell me honestly. Did they not, those strangers, materially enhance the delightfulness of the journey? It is one of those pleasures that nobody writes about and everybody feels." End quote. Undaunted by the prospect of being observed, Rachel Wilmer wrote in her journal of her tour to the Falls of Niagara, June 26, 1834, quote, in viewing the scenery all around, I was delighted and think it surpasses all description it was calculated to rise my thoughts from nature up to nature's God. Walk to Table Rock where Sam Patch took his leap, then under the spray until quite wet. After dinner, we took the steamboat to Buffalo, arose early and walked down to the shops of Indian curiosities, purchased some bracelets for servants, and we did a little shopping. Excited by the experience of travel, the young Boston artist Louisa D Davis Minot published her observations of an 1815 trip to Niagara in the North American Review, providing extensive descriptions of the train in addition to the oral atmosphere. Quote, on approaching the falls, the scene changes, the roar deepens, the spray rises a lofty column of vapor in the heavens, the rapids which commence about a mile above the brink of the falls now show their white heads, and the current increases its force so fast as to threaten to bear the frail bark along with it. The sublimity of the scene is frequently heightened by a thunderstorm. What sets Minot's observations apart from letters and diary entries are the visual counterparts to her verbal descriptions of the area. In particular, her Niagara Falls, as you see here from 1818, depicts the rush of the American and Horseshoe Falls. Minot's composition is not merely competent, Rather, it suggests training and expertise. The tumultuous sky, the spray from the falls, and the placement of figures to convey the geographical magnitude of the site result in a convincingly dramatic scene of the splendors of nature. 
In her journal of her trip to Canada from 1815, Louisa's older sister, Jane Minot Sedgwick, wrote thusly to her friends of their trip to the falls. My dear friends, this expedition has peril enough to make it an object for travelers, although on this side of the river you cannot see the scene so well below as above the precipice. Think of walking 150 feet down a perpendicular descent with the irregular juttings of the rocks for steps and trees for banisters. In some places, these steps are so distant that it is necessary to suspend your body from the limbs of the trees in order to reach them. And there are few parts of the way through which you can walk erectly. They were guided to Table Rock, where Jane makes mention of Louisa sketching. After walking a mile down steep rocks through swamps and woods, we came to this celebrated place. We were so much delighted with this view of the falls that my sister and I have risen with the sun and come to take our last look at them. It is on this rock that I am writing to you while my sister takes her sketch. Minot produced not one, but two beautiful paintings of Niagara Falls. Minot's placement of figures in this version is interesting. Note the woman in the company of a male companion. She adds an American Indian close to the falls in the lower right, while the foreground contains three additional men of cult different cultural and socioeconomic backgrounds. While the popularity of Niagara for travelers and artists alike increased rapidly throughout the 19th century, Minot's artistic ability bears noting. Her work appears before Alvin Fisher's The Great Horseshoe Falls, Niagara of 1820, and more than a decade before Thomas Cole's distant view of Niagara Falls from 1830. Minot's work demonstrates that she was able to travel and experience American scenery directly. She produced copious and detailed sketches wherever she traveled, as seen here in her Berkshire Journal. The physical experience of travel, coupled with a growing interest in the American landscape, and as such, women of a rising middle class expanded their knowledge of the American landscape through artistic instruction in areas of drawing, watercolor, and painting, promoted as part of an expanded educational program for women in the United States. Manuals dedicated to instruction in the art of landscape painting became plentiful by the early 19th century. With varying degrees of accomplishment, countless young female students filled their composition books with drawings copied from instruction manuals. Molly Brooks, for example, was educated with basic drawing skills. Within her drawing book is the figure of a young boy leaning against a tree. Her drawing is an obvious copy from page 18 of George Winchester's drawing series from 1851. Two well-known authors of instructional publications are Benjamin Coe and John Chapman. Chapman certainly intended women to gain instruction from his books, as he included vignette engravings of women, not men, drawing from nature at the end of each chapter of his 1847 manual, The American Drawing Book. Some such publications were written by women artists, such as Frances Palmer's 1847 New York Drawing Book and Maria Turner's The Young Lady's Assistant in Drawing and Painting from 1833, which is a concise example of a text aimed at a female audience. Turner instructed on process, form, and materials while providing rules for drawing on paper, stone, mezzotint, watercolors, oil painting, and print transfer. She was fully of the opinion that women could and should become artists. Quote, young ladies spend years to acquire their native tongue in which they are exercised daily. But many are sent to school to learn painting in one quarter. This is a very mistaken idea. Painting like all other art is founded on elementary principles and she who neglects them or considers the time lost which she spends to acquire them will fail of success of ever becoming a respectable artist. One artist, one pupil, Emma Healy, made paintings copied from engravings published in magazines and gift books. She became a watercolorist and teacher at the Orphan Asylum in Albany. Having received a diploma from the American Institute in 1846 for her watercolor flowers, she exhibited a book of paintings the following year. Her pen and ink drawing, A Picnic Party, is clearly a copy of Picnic on the Wissahickon from an engraving by William Croom from, 
for uh, Graham's Ladies and Gentlemen's Magazine of 1844. This scene depicts a group of young women and men enjoying an afternoon on the banks of the Wissahickon with a view of Fairmont, Pal Fairmont Park ma Mansion, excuse me, on the hill in the background. Further, a picnic on the Wissahickon is also known as a needlework of wool and silk from Philadelphia, circa 1850, demonstrating the variety of means by which popular sites in the American landscape resonated with women artists. Embroideries, for example, like paintings were framed and displayed in homes. It was an expensive proposition to have one's work framed, thus imbuing it with aesthetic work and value given the effort required for its production. It was chosen to adorn the wall of a parlor or drawing room for public display. How does this differ from the value ascribed to a painting by Cole or Durant? Both reflect an individual understanding of the principles of beauty and taste. While these artistic efforts have traditionally been interpreted as lovely and charming, they also further our understanding and appreciation for the American landscape in the early 19th century. Women created exquisite landscape drawings, paintings, and embroideries often to embellish the home. That these works were never intended to grace an academy wall or garner large commissions should not take away from their value as aesthetic objects. A library or drawing room with paintings by Cole or Durand most likely shared space with framed engravings and drawings, hand-painted porcelain, and embroidered needlework. Whether painting, print, or embroidery by well or little-known artists, all were time-consuming prospects. They were framed, viewed, and valued. How then is aesthetic work to be judged? Bringing instruction to a more widespread audience, amateur and professional artists often supported themselves by offering art education to young men and women. Newspapers in particular were the most common form of advertisement for lessons in drawing and painting. In fact, Thomas Cole's early years in the US were partly spent in Steubenville, Ohio, where his sisters established a seminary, similar to the myriad other educational establishments for young ladies developing in the early 19th century. In the Western Herald and Steubenville Gazette, the, sister, uh, the Cole sisters offered reading, writing, plain sewing, and Muslim needlework. And quote, Thomas Cole will instruct in painting and drawing three times a week between six and eight o'clock in the evening. Thus, as an amateur artist, Paul was part of the art education industry. The watercolor class that you see here, circa 1820, depicts an instructor observing the work of a female student while maintaining a physical and professional distance. Another woman has kept her bonnet on as if eager to get to work upon her arrival to class, perhaps late due to pressing domestic duties. Her supplies lay neatly beside her board. These are not women working from nature, sketching en plein air. Rather, they are at a physical remove from nature, working on subjects that remain unclear, although two of the four women work facing in the direction of the framed landscape views. For a woman in the early to mid 19th century, becoming a professional artist was daunting. Schooling provided rudiments of style, but hardly rigorous training required for a professional career. The domestic world held sway over the artistic and the validity of formal artistic education for women is part of a larger discussion on the appropriateness of educating women beyond a certain level. While countless men and women before the Civil War achieved the status of talented amateur artists, it is important to notice and acknowledge those women who, like Louisa Davis Minot, desire to rise above that level in the first decades of the 20th century. Sarah Cole, younger sister to Thomas, stands out as an artist of great talent who moved increasingly in the artistic circles of the mid 19th century. Sentimentalized by Thomas Cole's biographer, Louis Le Grand Noble, Sarah would become an accomplished artist in her own right and not merely a copyist of Thomas' works as some have asserted. She frequently enjoyed the company of her brother and often traveled as a single woman via sloops, steamboats, and stagecoaches, which was difficult, time-consuming, and at times dangerous. Upon her return to the city after a winter visit, Sarah wrote to Thomas on February 13, 1836, I have arrived last evening after a very tedious and disagreeable journey. 
Mr. T. Thompson will have told you that we did not leave Hudson until late in the evening as the stages of the Redbird line were full. And we had to wait for the old line, which proved to be very poor and full of passengers, not the most agreeable. I was very sick all night, really and actively sick. And this Mrs. Newton, although she sat next to me, never spoke one word to me. I might have died for what one would have known or cared. Sarah produced numerous paintings such as Ancient Column near Syracuse, which may have been inspired by Thomas's Column of Ancient Syracuse, displayed at his memorial exhibition in 1848. Sarah exhibited her paintings at the National Academy of Design, the Maryland Historical Society, and the American Art Union. Although she never traveled abroad, Sarah benefited artistically from the European journeys of Thomas, who was aware of and supported his sister's artistic talent. In fact, he wrote to Durand asking his friend to provide his sister with instruction in the art of etching, should he find time while he was in New York. Although none of her engraved work has been located yet, and I think that might be forthcoming in the 2023 exhibition, three of her, of her etchings were listed in the catalog of the highly publicized 1888 exhibition, Women Etchers of America at the Union League Club in New York. So significant was Sarah Cole to the painter etcher movement that although she died in 1857, hers were the only works to be included by a non-contemporary artist. On a personal level, Sarah provided her brother and fellow artist Thomas with support and understanding. Their letters often mentioned financial troubles, but Sarah also addressed her brother's concern that he was losing his artistic ability during the summer of 1836, a pivotal time for Thomas Cole with respect to his Course of Empire series and the recent death of his patron Lumen Reed. Sarah's response to his disparaging words while loving and encouraging also reflects their mutual love for landscape painting. She writes, in a little while, you will find that the art will return to you and that you will return to the art with renewed pleasure. The lights and shadows of this life are like the lights and shadows of your own pictures. The one makes the other more beautiful. And although we have had many troubles, we have not found this life all shadows. It has been now a light, then a shadow, then a light, now a shadow. I really think that your fears of losing your art are groundless. Compassionate words from sister to brother, artist to artist. Thus, Sarah Cole is an excellent example of a 19th century woman landscape painter who traveled to and enjoyed the American landscape, was instructed in the fine arts, produced paintings and etchings, and exhibited and sold her work through professional venues. In addition to the Coles, the Peel family consists of an extensive list of artists, both male and female. As Charles and his brother James believe in the democratic education of the sexes, sisters, wives, daughters, and nieces received artistic training. Marrying into the Peel family, Harriet Caney Peel, the second wife of Rembrandt Peel, brought with her financial assets from her previous marriage and her family's mercantile business. A prenuptial agreement was signed before their union in 1840 to the effect that Rembrandt would claim possession neither to her money nor to her possession. She, in fact, was responsible for providing him with the comforts of home during the two decades that they were married. An educated and talented artist, Harriet often assisted her husband as a copyist of his portraits of George Washington. Before and after her marriage, Harriet exhibited her paintings at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. She was an active artist throughout the 1850s. Paintings such as Cattersville Clove suggest that Peel was well aware of a Ruskinian approach to the depiction of nature. Given the close relationship between Rembrandt, Peel, and Durand, Harriet would have been well versed in the truth to nature philosophy espoused by both men. Regarding her gender and her career, she invariably signed her compositions H.C. Peel on the front of her canvases and Mrs. Rembrandt Peel on the verso. Her marital status was clearly part of her identity, yet the use of her initials concealed her gender to the public, a device later employed consciously by artists such as Mary Nemo Moran. The aesthetic appeal of paintings by artists such as Harriet Peel is evident, yet one wonders how were women able to accomplish the task of simply getting to those outcroppings or hillside vistas, given the cumbersome complexities of their dress. 
Although horse and carriages certainly assisted in transporting individuals to sites of interest, much was accomplished on foot. Travel and tourism for women was facilitated by a vast network of mercantile establishments who offered a wide variety of sundries and clothing for the lady traveler. Women could purchase appropriate garments for outdoor excursions at dry goods and department stores, such as John Wanamaker in Philadelphia, Burbank and Enrike in Pittsfield, and Hortons of Boston. Unlike fashions for men, women's fashion inflicted on wearers the extra burden and long, often woolen skirts, stockings, petticoats, and heels, making their climbs arduous and at times uncomfortable in the heat. Such encumbrances are noticeable, as depicted by Winslow Homer. In the Bridal Path, White Mountains of 1865, Riding side saddle for modesty, the young woman in her long white dress and gloves guides her horse carefully over the Rocky Mountains of New Hampshire without assistance. This is not a study of the forces of nature as the artist would later explore. His focus is the woman, the horse, and the landscape in that order. Homer chose not to pair the ruggedness of nature with a male figure. Rather, he highlights the calm and serenity achieved through nature as experienced here by a woman. Homer's work reinforces the point that women had access not only to artistic training, but to experience the American landscape directly. By mid-century and the years surrounding the Civil War, increasing numbers of women were educated in the mechanical arts and obtained wider access to formal artistic training at schools such as Sarah Peters Philadelphia School of Design for Women. Women artists continued to pursue their artistic and professional opportunities at home and abroad from the 1860s onward. Despite setbacks such as inflated tuition for women who wished to study at the Académie Julienne, culminating experiences would include participation in the 1876 Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia, involvement at the 10th Street Studio Building and in the Painter Etcher Movement, and exhibiting at the Women's Pavilion as part of the Columbian Exposition in 1893. Additionally, Brooklyn became an enclave for women artists in the 19th century. The Brooklyn Eagle noted in 1868 in its art gossip column, quote, the number of women artists in New York and its neighborhood has for some time been steadily increasing. So much so indeed as to justify the formation of a society whose object is to assist those ladies who may need help in the prosecution of their studies. Artists such as Susie Barstow, Mary Josephine Walters, Laura Woodward, and Eliza Greatrex, for example, demonstrate the varying degrees to which women artists variously struggled, flourished, and earned their living in the arts. What unites each of these artists is their commitment to the formal properties of the Hudson River School, including a romantic sensibility, picturesque properties and well-balanced compositions resulting from direct observation of the American landscape. Susie Barstow achieved notoriety in her day for Hudson River School style landscapes. While she maintained a studio in Brooklyn, she, frequently, uh, she frequented the Adirondacks and the White Mountains for inspiration. She studied in France, Switzerland, Germany, Holland, and Belgium. Her studio was certainly known to many and described as Ms. Barstow's, Ms. Barstow's dainty studio. In Landscape of 1865, the framing boughs in the foreground triangulate into the distance as the perspective leads back to an endless sense of depth in these secluded woods. Her mature style of the 1860s reflects a keen awareness of the artistic style of Asher Durand. Close to 100 paintings by Barstow have been documented, yet few today are extant. So too was Barstow an inveterate hiker. It is said she climbed over 110 separate mountain peaks over the course of her career. The 1889 issue of the White Mountain Echo noted that Barstow had climbed all the principal peaks of the Catskills, Adirondacks, and White Mountains, as well as, as, well as those of the Alps and Black Forest often tramping 25 miles a day and sketching as well, often in the midst of a blinding snowstorm. That mountainous terrain is reflected well in the background of Mountain Lake in autumn. Laura Woodward ventured north and south. Woodward, like Cole, 
and many other women never married. Like Barstow, she traveled and sketched throughout New England in the early to mid 1870s, making plein air studies as far north as Clarendon, Vermont. Her 1874 untitled painting, possibly of Clarendon, demonstrates her exceptional skill and clear commitment to the aesthetic qualities of the Hudson River School. She moved to Florida in the 1880s, and as Deborah Pollock has noted, her work contributed to the formation of Palm, Palm Beach as a resort destination. Woodward provided some of the earliest views of the Everglades and the Florida landscape as a growing tourist industry in much the same way that artists such as Cole and Duran provided early romantic views of the Hudson River Valley in the 1830s and 40s. Not all women worked in oil on canvas. Frances Fanny Palmer was one of the most important lithographers for Courier Knives, producing over 200 prints. Having emigrated from England as a young woman, her original designs of an idealized American landscape were purchased and disseminated into thousands of homes as she supported her family through her income. The 2018 monograph by Charlotte Rubenstein offers great details and insight into Palmer's life and career. Mary Nemo Moran was a prominent artist of the American etching movement of the late 19th century. Of all the Moran family members, however, Mary's husband, Thomas Moran, is the most renowned, famous for his expansive panoramas of the American West from the 1870s to the turn of the century. She accompanied Thomas on two expeditions out West, one in 1872 and again in 1874 to Yosemite National Park. While it is often asserted that travel was too rigorous for Mary, her roles as mother, wife, artist, and business manager would not allow lengthy stays away from home. However, when together, Thomas and Mary shared a pronounced interest in painting the terrain of New Jersey and East Hampton, Long Island, and became prolific watercolorists colorists, and etchers of Eastern views. In contrast to Thomas's large painted canvases of the American West, Mary Nemo Moran was able to impose a panoramic quality to her Eastern landscapes. They are intimate and small while allowing, the while allowing the viewer to experience nature on a very personal scale. This view of Three Mile Harbor in East Hampton, I contend is just as provocative as the expansive Grand Canyon imagery that gained Thomas fame and notoriety. Within the artistic climate of the late 19th century, however, Mary Nemo Moran found that by concealing her gender through an abbreviated signature, such as M. Nemo Moran or M. N. Moran, she gained membership into elite artistic societies who otherwise would have had no female members. Quote, it scarce seems a ladylike work that begins in a scratching and ends in a biting. So read an 1893 review of etchings by Mary Nemo Moran at the New York Etching Club. The matter of gender as it related to the perception of women artists was a poignant issue. Technically and formally, the matter of stylistic differentiation between male and female artists was raised often. One critic in praise of Mary's work felt compelled to justify her technical abilities based on a male instituted hierarchy. Quote, her plates, as has frequently been said, would never reveal her sex. Her work was direct, emphatic, and bold to a point even that would not be attempted by male workers in the same line of art. And her wise avoidance of affectation and incongruities resulted in the production of plates that had about them no suggestion of a woman's hand. Whether or not a gendered line could be ascertained, Mary, like other women artists, continued to receive critical praise for innovative techniques and bold compositions, despite being denied access to male-dominated exhibition venues. Widowed early and left to support her children and herself through her work as an artist, Eliza Greatorex educated herself and her daughters in Europe. And like Nemo Moran was part of the painter etcher movement of the latter 19th century. Her paintings demonstrate her admiration for the beauty of American scenery and place her work firmly within the style of the Hudson River School. An associate member of the National Academy of Design, she often worked on plein air as for her training, and her palette and depiction of light suggest intimate observations of the surrounding natural environment. 
She exhibited her work in the Women's Pavilion at the 1876 Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia. And like Mary Nemo Moran, she ventured west in the early 1870s and produced a publication that combined her experiences in both image and text. Summer Etchings in Colorado was published in 1873 at a time when those on government-sponsored expeditions were documenting the region and Thomas Moran was producing engravings, watercolors, um, and panoramic paintings of the American West, Greater X was there too, exploring the rugged terrain. Her first person description of Colorado speaks to the perseverance, driving curiosity and undaunted quest to seek out and capture on paper or canvas those locales in the American landscape that characterized the 19th century landscape movement. She writes, I congratulated myself on being finally equipped for the tramp up the canyon. Short walking dress, stout boots, and veil tied over my much suffering and rebellious nose, for the sun burns fearfully here. My boots seemed most unfit to be trusted, my dress a mere encumbrance, my veil no shield, for looking upward there rose before us a straight wall of stones bedded in gritty sand. We, the petticoated ones of the party, tucked our draperies taut and snug, and went sliding, slipping, tripping, tumbling, till we felt we must be turning into atoms of an avalanche. Whirling down that awful slide, we came breathless and almost stunned to the other side of the bath. I want to add that a brilliant monograph on Eliza Brayerex has just been published. Restless Enterprise, The Art and Life of Eliza Pratt Graderex by Kathy Manthorne paves the way for more intensive studies of these women artists, and it truly is a must read. Lastly, Mary Josephine Walters received training from Asher Durand. Editors of the Brooklyn Eagle were well aware of Walters' ability. Quote, Ms. Walters has attained great excellence in landscape painting. Having been a student with Durand, Ms. W seems to have learned the manipulations of that master and sketches and paints with delicacy and a good deal of elaboration. She maintained a studio in the YMCA building in New York, lived in Brooklyn as many other women artists had in the 1860s and 70s, and by 1880, she lived with her mother in Hohokus, New Jersey. Walters did not marry, nor did she have children, this afforded her time to travel to the woods of Northern New Jersey and the Catskills, as well as the freedom from domestic expectations of marriage. She exhibited actively at the National Academy of De Design and the Brooklyn Art Association, in addition to venues as far west as the San Francisco Art Association. Her undated Hudson River scene attests to her admiration for the woods and waters of the Hudson Valley in this romanticized scene of an expansive sky, calm water, and framing mountains, coupled with the diminutive presence of mankind via the canoes in the foreground. The presence of the unoccupied boat suggests that this is no longer a place of wilderness, but a place of gentle commingling between humans and nature further reinforced by the planks of wood resting on the naturally felled trees in the foreground. And here I conclude with a current mystery. I was not long ago with the owner of this beautiful landscape painting by an unknown woman artist, and other works by this artist are also um, in the family's collection. I believe they may be by Mary Josephine Walters. The work is signed only Mary which would be unusual for the artist, but the style when compared to known works by Walters is elegant and relatively convincing. The story from the family is that the man who owned the painting, who was a relative, was in love with a woman artist named Mary, who died much too young in his arms. Curiously, Walters, who never did marry, died a year before this man married his first wife, Thusly, the painting may, painting may have been given as a private memento, never intended to be publicly displayed, and thus explains perhaps the artist's choice to sign the work simply Mary. It sounds very romantic, but it does encourage me to explore my more biographical info on Walters. Who knows, maybe this love story really is true. Landscape paintings of exceptional quality by 19th century women artists are continually coming to light and to market. 
while talented gallerists such as Jennifer Krieger of Hawthorne Fine Arts are responsible in part for our increased awareness of these works, the groundbreaking research by scholars such as Laura Prieto, April Mastin, Kirsten Swinth, Jackie Mazzaccio, Kathy Manthorn, Kirsten Buick, Melissa DeBacchus, among so many others that I apologize for not mentioning here, move our knowledge and appreciation forward. The 2023 exhibition at the Thomas Cole House will bring together beautiful historical paintings from both public and private collections, in addition to contemporary women currently engaged in nature. While gender and cultural constructs have been contributing factors for this talk, the paintings themselves reflect the American landscape experience as it evolved across the 19th century. As these women were painting and sketching, they were committed to capturing the beauty, awe, and majesty of the national landscape. In addition to the artists mentioned today, there are many more women landscape painters of the 19th century that deserve scholarly attention. Julie Hart Beers, Fidelia Bridges, Charlotte Buell Coleman, Edith Wilkinson Cook, Elizabeth Jerome, Mary Blood Mellon, Evelina Mount, and this as of yet unidentified artist who sits at her easel, painted sketches scattered on the floor behind her, composing a beautiful landscape taken from direct observations of American scenery. It remains important then to recast 19th century American women landscape artists no longer as the exception, as Ernst Gold would have had us believe, but rather as exceptional. Thank you so much. Betsy, I will turn this back over to you. Thank you, Nancy, so much. Um, I'm pulling up the Q&A box here. We have already quite a few lined up. Anybody who would like to click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and add your question, and I'll read them to Nancy. So I just love it when you talk, Nancy. Thank you so much for all that information and imagery. It's very inspiring and empowering. So let's see what we have here. Um, oh, look at this. So one person says, um, do you, Nancy, do you feel your research into these strong women has influenced your own life and how you approach your work? Oh, that is such a great question. <laughs> um, I would have to say yes. Um, of course. I think that, um, very early on, my parents were wedded to this idea of taking me to museums and exposing me to art as early as possible and formulating my own ideas about what I saw. And it really wasn't until later when I began this research that I thought about how that resonated with me to sort of surround yourself with landscapes to um, think about the lives of these women. You know, I'm sitting here very comfortably in my study with a lovely cup of tea. I might take a walk later on in comfortable shoes. The ways in which these women traveled, um, their perseverance, they were so stalwart in their determination to get out into nature that I find that incredibly inspiring oftentimes, and also given um, the roadblocks that they were up against, right? Having to pay more tuition than men at the Academy Julian, simply because of their gender or not being able to have access to display their works in certain venues or having their work discussed as a gendered line. I am in awe of these women. And thank you for asking that question because it still inspires me to research so many more of these artists who have these uh, wonderful narratives that need to be told. Yes, I feel that way too. Um, several people are, are asking to, to repeat the title author of the book about Eliza Greatorex. Oh my goodness, it is with pleasure that I will. It is called Restless Enterprise, The Art and Life of Eliza Pratt Greatorex by Kathy Manthorne. And as soon as this book arrived on my doorstep, I ripped open the packaging and sat myself down and began to read. And it is engaging and thoughtful and so well crafted. And what I appreciate so much about Kathy's scholarship, not only is she an, an extremely elegant writer and a, a painstaking researcher, 
But her work is so groundbreaking and it validates for so many of us the work that we're doing on these women. Um, the idea of having these monographs published is so important. Um, you know, we were talking amongst ourselves, I know with Kate and Amanda and, and with you, Betsy, about why there have not been these retrospective exhibitions and how many of these works will grace the walls and can we make these deep dives and really investigate just a few of these women artists because indeed there are plenty of works to grace these walls and those are the things that we want to showcase. Yes, and it was really eye opening to have when our first exhibition in 2010 a survey showing many American women artists, um, because that alone was so eye opening that there were so many. Um, and now the decision to choose a few and go deeper also contradicts the newest misunderstanding, which is that, well, they didn't paint very much, you know, so, all right, so we'll attack one misunderstanding at a time. Um, so uh, let's see, another question um, about education for women. Was it primarily in Europe or were, were there academies in America as well? So that's a wonderful question. One of the um, sort of dividing lines tends to be around the years of the Civil War. Afterwards, and certainly with more um, individuals going on the grand tour, there were a lot of opportunities for women, not only at home, but also abroad. Um, they would create very intimate communities in London, in Paris, in Florence, in Rome. They knew one another, artists, writers, writers, poets, um, and so they could support one another. Back in the States, I mean, if we think about, right, when the first academies are established in America, so if we're thinking, you know, 1820s, 1830s, it's a relatively short span of time in which these formal educational centers are open um, before people just begin in growing, going abroad. You know, we have to think too about what did women have access to? Landscape was um, a subject matter that was deemed appropriate, that it did not um, in any way infringe upon a woman's modesty. For example, if you were studying the human form, right? So women didn't have access to studying nude male figures. They worked from casts. So landscape, I think, was well-suited um, for a number of women in the earlier part of the 19th century who wanted to gain experience as professional artists. And like all artists, male and female, they would go into private collections and study works of art there. They would go into the academies. They would study at the annual exhibitions. So with an increased um, opportunity and access to art, um, artists, male and female, oftentimes worked from copies as a way to um, become um, more pronounced artists. Um, this question, the person acknowledges it might be outside a little bit of your expertise, but I think it's really an interesting question, which is, do you see the rise of women landscape painters with the rise of women's rights to own land? And I think that that ownership of land is such an interesting twist on this because the male gaze is often one of lordship, you know, looking over all that you own or that you control. And so this idea that women couldn't even own land at the time, I, I don't know, it says with the Homestead Acts of the 1870s, I believe more women were entitled to own land on their own. Is there a connection between women as land owners and land painters? That is such a fascinating comment, um, as well as question. Um, so clearly, uh, the legalities of land ownership is not my area of expertise. But it's fascinating when you think about right the distinction between someone like Louisa Davis Minot, who's going out in the 1820s, um, and the constraints that were placed upon her and where she was able to travel and where she was not able to travel to versus someone like Eliza Brejarex. Um, those expansive views going out west, right? This idea to see and appreciate the landscape, I would have to think in many ways would be tied to 
more general parlance about women being able to own land. I, I don't know those particulars, but I've, I've just jotted that down because now that's something that I have to find out. That's just a brilliant observation to make. That's fascinating. Thank you I, so I much love that, that question. I love that. I love that. Yeah. Um, so let's see what else we have here. We have a lot of questions lined up, so I'm going to get to them uh, as many as I can. Um, so, oh, this is a really a, a comment and a question. This is from a woman artist. As an artist who is a woman, my experience is that women are still, for the most part, treated as amateurs. What has your experience been? That's a sad statement. Yes. Yet, I say that bringing these women to light is our charge to move forward. It is our ammunition, right? That we use these historical precedents as the basis to have these conversations. Um, and for women artists practicing today, I mean, I think this is one of the reasons why for the 2023 exhibition, it was not just historical voices, but it's contemporary voices so that we can really enlarge this conversation and drive the narrative in directions that are current and compelling in so many ways. Yeah. Um, a couple questions here about whether there are biographies written about any of the other women artists, for example, Sir Susie Barstow. So, not monographically. And this is, I think, what we are trying to raise awareness about and move forward. Um, I mean, I think Kathy Manthor is working on Fidelia Bridges as we speak. There is a lot of interest in bringing these women to light. The monograph on uh, Fanny Frances Palmer, Frances Flora Bond Palmer, who was the most important lithographer not the most important women lithographer, the most important lithographer for Currier and Ives. Um, Charlotte Rubenstein's uh, 2018 monograph, and it's, in, it's an enormous tome, is incredibly important. And that book took a long time to get published. Uh, and I think when Charlotte was beginning her research, she had to prove her case for why this was an important publication. You know, I hope that as the years continue, that there no longer needs to be that justification, but it's filling these very important voids. Um, and so the more that we see these women artists in exhibitions, the more they're written about in exhibition catalogs, the more uh, that students of art history and cultural studies and American studies will see these women and want to research them. And those are the people who will move forward and say, I want to do a monograph study on Susie Barstow. I want to do it on, right? And so this is what happens. It will be this multi-generational step forward of younger artists, younger scholars saying, oh, this is the norm. You know, the fact that we're having this conversation about male and female artists. When Mary Nima Moran was criticized for her line, whether or not you could discern if it was made by a woman, we have not come so far from that. I remember standing in front of a Susie Barstow and the conversation was, oh, I can tell this is by a woman. And I stood back and I contained and controlled myself, but I was fascinated by that and why that still mattered so deeply. So we have a lot of work to do. Oh, that's so interesting. There's a, a participant who's wondering about that story of the, the painting signed only Mary and wondered if there is a painting that has the artist's complete name so that you can compare how Mary was written. Well, if we compare it to um, Mary Walters, she does not usually sign her name that way. Mm -hmm. um, so Mary Josephine Walters. So there was that. They, the other works, and such a great question, the other works that are in that collection are also signed just Mary. And so, right, even if we think about collectively, if we look, I mean, look at Cole paintings by Thomas Cole. Does he often sign his name Thomas? Does Durand oftentimes sign his paintings Asher? I think there's an intimacy about that relationship of the painter 
to its recipient. I mean, I love the very romantic story that's built around it and how this woman dies in her lover's arms before they were able to marry. It just means I have a lot of work to do. Yep, that, that sums up this topic, doesn't it? A lot of work to do. <laughs> Yes, yes. <laughs> that's, our, that's our main takeaway here. Um, okay, well, it's uh, just a little after three. So maybe I, with apologies to all the unanswered questions, um, I will um, do one more. Um, and uh, well, there's a, there's a comment here. Uh, I would love to have a list of all the women artists and women art historians mentioned. Um, so, uh, and, so maybe we can provide that on our website when this video goes up and it will go up on the web. So people who miss something or want to hear it again, you can find it at thomascole.org a little later on. And the person also comments, um, please continue to do this on Zoom. I'm too far away to attend. <laughs> so we actually have a lot of people. We have someone joining from Germany today who made a comment. So it's really, it is quite an expansion of audience this way. That is wonderful. It has been such a pleasure to be here. And I will provide that list. And I think that some of your audience might be amazed at the length of that list. It goes on and on and on. And I know that the list I provide you will not be comprehensive. So again, uh, we have a lot of work to do. But I was thrilled to be able to spend some time with you today and uh, sharing my ideas and what my thoughts have been on these remarkable women artists. And look forward to working with you and uh, the rest of the folks at the Thomas Cole National Historic Site on this new and engaging exhibition project. So yeah, thank Nancy, you we're, much. we're so lucky to have you working with us. We're thrilled. Thank you for your thank extraordinary you. scholarship. And um, I'd like to thank the people who made this talk possible. Um, first of all, we have dedicated this year's Sunday Salon series in the, to the memory of our longtime supporter, David Gray, who never missed uh, one of these lectures. And support is provided by a Humanities New York Action Grant with support from the National Endowment for the Humanities, a New York State Council on the Arts with the support of Governor Andrew Cuomo and the New York State Legislature. Empire State Development's I Love New York program under the Market New York Initiative, and a special thanks to the Kindred Spirits Society of the Thomas Cole National Historic Site who support everything we do. So, and thank you everyone for joining us on this Sunday Salon. Everyone enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye everybody. Thank Bye. you.